everybody. Uh, I'm Stephanie Guthrie, and I'm going to speak to you today about boundaries in ethics. Um, I feel compelled to start by saying I'm sorry. This is not a presentation about dogs. There will be no more dogs in this presentation other than on my cover, but I, hey, that's a way to start off with a win, right? So um, just went for the, the happy puppy image. But um, we are talking about um, et ethics today and specifically how boundaries play a critical role in maintaining our ethics. Um, I'm Stephanie Guthrie, if you haven't met me before, I am a one of the um, trainers for the state CPRS uh, program. I am also president of the newly formed Tennessee Association of Peer Specialists, so I'm going to go ahead and put in a plug for us. Um, hopefully you'll hear more about them throughout the conference. But if you want to uh, check us out on Facebook at Tennessee Association of Peer Specialists, if you type that in the search bar, it should take you to our page. Feel free to join our group. Um, let's get started talking about boundaries. So the first thing as we talk about uh, boundaries and ethics is, is addressing why we need ethics and boundaries. And so, um, Ethics is really critical. Um, anybody, any of the other CPRS trainers who have ever trained with me can attest that when it comes time to, all of us trainers have our favorite sections we like to teach. And, and when it comes time for ethics, I'm always like, oh, Mimi, can I teach this one? Can I teach this one? Because I just feel like ethics are truly the foundation of the work we do. And that if we are not solidly grounded in our ethics, then anything else that we do is is has has lost its impact, has lost its meaning. It becomes essentially invalidated if there are ethical va violations. So it's that critical. It's it really is truly the foundation of the work we do. And so one of the things that we see as CPRS is when there have been eth ethical violations in the past, those ethical violations are never uh, about somebody maliciously setting out to violate their ethics. Um, the, it's, it's always about gray area, slippery slope, those kinds of things um, that somebody finds themselves almost accidentally falling into an ethical violation. And so that's why we think it's really critical to talk about um, when, when, when people are knowingly making a mistake, then you, you correct that mistake. But it's, it's really harder when it's like, hey, we just need you to be hyper vigilant to make sure that you don't mess up in this, the most important area to mess up in. And so that's why we um, make ethics a required component of your CEUs every year and try to find different ways to talk and, uh, about the subject and approach it. And so today I really want to talk to you about that when there are boundary issues, that those lead to ethical issues. And so we want to keep our boundaries in check so that our ethics stay in check. And so start off with, um, let's look at why we need ethics. Um, first of all, protects the members from harm. Um, we know that ethical violations, uh, you're essentially just harming the member, um, that they need a place where they can feel safe. And in, in violating those ethics, you have put them in a vulnerable, unsafe position. Similarly, um, it also protects you from harm. <laughs> My dog is falling on the ground behind me if you hear random thuds. He's 20 years old. He doesn't get around so great. Look, I said there were no more dogs in the presentation, and I was wrong, um, although I don't think he's going to make a show. I think you're just going to hear about him. Um, but so ethical um, issues also protect you from harm. As, or we need ethics to protect you from harm. If you if you stay in that very clear, safe ethical area, then that's keeping you safe as well in in all kinds of ways, physically safe, emotionally safe, keeping your job safe, those kinds of things. And then also um, it protects your agency from harm. So we know that essentially you are a representative of your agency. So if you cross into um, ethical issues and, and, and put your reputation and your job at risk, you've put the reputation of your entire agency at risk. So by staying in a, in a clear ethical zone, we're pr protecting members, yourself and your agency all from harm. And really, um, by in a broader sense, 
protecting the entire community. Because once we get into ethical violations, those things have a tendency to trickle further out than just the immediate people involved. <clears throat> Similarly, when we look at boundaries, why do we need boundaries? Well, we need boundaries because that also is protecting members from harm, yourself from harm, your agency from harm. So um, you can see the, the correlation, the connectedness. As your boundaries slip, then, then you start slipping into those ethical areas. And that's really the focus of the presentation today is helping you keep in mind that if you're, if you're watching your boundaries, your ethics should stay in place. Um, but the, the two do go in hand in hand. It's not just about an ethical violation. For an ethical violation to occur, typically it's a result of boundaries having been missed. So let's talk about defining your boundaries. Um, we're gonna have different boundaries for in all kinds of, uh, they're gonna be influenced by different factors, right? So our boundaries are, um, we got the little stop go here. And um, I, I find this, when I was looking at graphics to put in, I, I, I thought, I don't like that this, this red hand stop is negative and this green thumb go is positive. Like it, it just kind of comes across as saying when we say to stop, that's a negative thing, but it's not always a negative thing. We need to stop sometimes, right? So, um, so know that we have boundaries in both directions. We got to know when to stop, but we got to know when to go too. And our boundaries can impede in either of those directions. And some of the things that um, some of the factors that can um, define our boundaries include the situation. So my boundaries might be a little different um, if I'm working, I can be working with the same member, but I'm working with them on one day in a rap class that has 10 other people. And I'm working on them another day, they're alone in my office with me crying and talking to me about experiencing suicidal ideation. Okay, my boundaries with that member might be a little different. They shouldn't be dramatically different, but they, but they might be a little different. Whereas I'm probably not gonna stop in the middle of a rap class and go hug a member. And, and again, and always varying situations, whatever, but typically speaking, that's not a, a standard part of a rap class. But I might stop in the middle and, and go up to the member and say, is it okay if I give you a hug, if they're in there crying, you know, those kinds of things. So. So just situation can, can certainly impact our boundaries. Your relationship to a person certainly impacts your boundaries. My boundaries are dramatically different with my husband than they are with any members that I work with. And it's still different still than they are with, with my friends. And then they are with, uh, my mom has a different set of boundaries. Um, so just your relationship with the person, <coughs> excuse me, will help define um, you know, what boundaries are appropriate for you. And then the setting. Um, my husband could come up to me at home and put a big old smooch on my lips and I'm generally going to respond very positively and smooch him right back and, you know, thanks, hon. Love you too. Uh, but if he comes up and does that, it's the same person, exact same situation, comes up, give me a smooch on my mouth, but it's at work, you know, he comes in and surprises me at my office and, and lays one on me, then I'm, that's, I'm not okay with that. You know, hey, that's not professional. You can't be kissing me at work. That's inappropriate. So, um, so different, all other factors the same, but the setting's different and that changes what the boundaries are. So there's a number of factors that can define what your boundaries are. And so just making sure that you're aware of those. And, and you know, I think it's important to keep in mind all these factors as we're determining, you know, where our boundaries are and, and when we look at evaluating, am I having any boundary issues? So as a CPRS, there's a couple of uh, components that need to be very much in place in, in our work with members. So our boundaries have to be very clear. Um, one of the first things I recommend is, is as soon as a member, hopefully when your member starts working with your agency, they receive a list of, you know, these are either the rules of the place or the policies and procedures, whatever terminology you use, but this is what it means to receive services here. That's what this is going to look like. We want them to know you know what to expect and 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 
uh, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And we want you to be clear on your boundaries as well. So the first time you're working with a new member, um, you may need uh, help helping them understand what, what are the appropriate boundaries <clears throat> um, for sharing and um, for contacting you. Is it okay to contact you after hours? Is it not okay? Um, uh, you know, what are, what are, uh, is it, is it fine to just pop into my office at any time or do I have certain hours or does the door have to be open, closed, knock first, not knock first, all kinds of little boundaries, but just making sure that it's very clear what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And people, um, have, certainly have different assumptions. Some people are very okay with certain things and other people are completely not okay with those. And so it needs to be clear. We don't want to give them confusion on what's okay because they may have experienced different situations in life that makes it seem like certain things are more appropriate and you're not as comfortable and they're not as fitting for your setting. So you want to make sure that all of that is communicated very clearly. You also want to make sure that whatever boundaries you set, they have to apply to everyone. And this is important and it's, um, I, I think it's, it can be really tricky. This is one of the places where we can totally get into one of those gray areas. Um, because it is, you know, sometimes easy to, to to have a favorite member that you're, oh, they, they just always, you know, they're so helpful and they do what I need and they're nice to be around. But, you know, we can't, we can't show favoritism. We got to have those, those boundaries in place. Similarly, there may be some members, sometimes you work with members that make you a little uncomfortable. So if I'm uncomfortable with a member and don't want them to have my cell phone number, that's appropriate, but if I don't give that member my cell phone number, then I need to not be giving it to other members. So whatever boundaries you set, they need to apply to everyone. So think about, you know, kind of what is your, when it, when it comes to things like that, that could be optional, um, where do you stand on things like that? If you're, if somebody asks you to go to an AA meeting with them, are you willing to go to an AA meeting with every one of your members? You know, well, no, this member just really needs me to, they're just more shy, they just want me to go, well, you, you've got to be willing to do that for everyone. So just anytime somebody asks you to do something uh, that, you know, maybe isn't a standard, okay, this is a part of my job every day, and you have to kind of think about, you know, is my answer yes or no here, then then really the question becomes, would I do this for everyone? And then that kind of helps you decide what your answer can be. And then, of course, your boundaries uh, must adhere to the code of ethics. Everything that we do as CPRSs must adhere to the code of ethics. Obviously, we consider the code of ethics critical. Again, that's why we have, you know, annual training. We ask that everybody um, periodically look at your code of ethics. It's always available online if you don't have a hard copy. Um, but make sure that you're always adhering to that code of ethics. And, and by keeping your boundaries in the appropriate place, it, it's just easier. You're, you're less likely to fall into any of those issues that, that might turn into ethical issues if your boundaries are in an appropriate place. So let's talk about different types of boundary issues. Um, so I talked a minute ago about that whole positive image, negative image. It, it, we, it, it, same here, right? We got a check mark that's like, yes, these are good. And uh, survey says, no, these are bad. But really that's neither are inherently good nor bad. Um, your ethical, some people are, when we say yes and no boundaries, um, when I, what I'm meaning by yes boundaries, um, the, the people who have issues with yes boundaries often uh, are, are, are saying yes. I mean, that's it. That's, that's what it boils down to for me is that their inherent answer to everything is yes. What can I do for you? And it, 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 it typically comes from a really well-meaning place. Uh, it, it wants to, wants to be a helper. Um, it feels good to help, right? So it's not just about that you're a helper, but there's a little selfish element of, oh, I like the feeling of when I'm helpful. Um, it's, it's about not wanting to let people down. It's about, you know, uh, hey, I can, so why wouldn't I? You know, all these kinds of things. It's typically um, from coming from a, a seemingly altruistic place. My intentions were absolutely in the right place. And I see this a lot in CPRSs for any of the helping fields. You're going to have an abundance of people who have a hard time 
with their yes boundaries being too loose and that their answer to everything is yes, I'll help. What else can I do? What else can I do to the, till they got their plate loaded full? Um, when we look at yes boundaries, it's, you know, I'm not trying to psychoanalyze anybody here or anything like that, but it can come from a number of places, including just from a desire to be liked or to be helpful. I want to be that person that everybody perceives as being super helpful and you can always count on me. Um, I know that in my professional life, I have challenges with my yes boundaries. They are a lot of times too loose. So I do say yes to everything. Stephanie, we want you, I, I've got, you, I know you've got 13 big projects you're working on, but I really need help with this 14th. Can you put it on your plate? Yeah, sure. Why not? Even though I'm drowning, I'm literally losing sleep. I'm staying up late at night to, to get all this accomplished, but I don't want to let anybody down, right? And so I think um, uh, a lot of us have challenge again anytime you're in that helping field you've got an abundance of people who have a little too loose with their yes they want it we, we're by nature we're helpers we want to help people so we want to say yes to everything it can also come just from being uh, uncomfortable with conflict sometimes it's easier to say yes than to push back and say well you know no I really don't have time to do that can you ask somebody else you know that's an uncomfortable statement to make sometimes or uh, you know, any, anything like that that's perceived, I don't want to be perceived as the person you can't count on. So, I, you know, I'm uncomfortable with a conflict here. Um, again, can come from any number of places, but those are some common things that we see when we've got people who are a little loose with their yeses and they just want to say yes to everything because they intend to be helpful. On the other side, we also have folks who can be a little too tight with their no answers that that if, if particularly when something new comes up hasn't been explored before instinctively the answer is no here's why we can't do that you know and and that that you know without a let me pause and think about this but just that inner gut feeling is no 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 um we can't do that i tend to be as i said on my professional life um i have challenges with my yes boundaries in my personal life, I have challenges with my no boundaries. I say no too much. And and um, where that impacts me most is that I do keep people kind of um, a little bit at arm's distance until uh, I, I'm very slow to bring, to let people into my life. And I, and I know that I've missed out on some valuable people in my life and some really great and fantastic people because um, I, I tend to keep people at arm's length and that's something, you know, just in being aware of it is something I'm working on. For a number of years, I had uh, two Facebook accounts, a, prefer a personal and a professional. And if I met you in any capacity through work, period, you were going on that professional page. And there's nothing wrong with having two different pages. Lots of people do. But the, the challenge I was having is if you're on my professional page, that's like if I know you in any way through, if I met you through work, you're on my professional page and that's it. Um, and, and I missed out on really connecting and becoming friends with people that I could have been friends with um, because I was so locked in. No, they belong in the work category. And so um, didn't connect with some great people that I could have and finally recognized that like, eh, my boundaries are being too tight here. I'm missing out on some awesome people. And so I blew the whole thing up and <laughs> changed how I approached it. Um, so th that's to say, you know, uh, just, I think inherently some of this will ring through. Most people will identify themselves more strongly with having challenges with yes boundaries. Other people will be no boundaries. And it's not uncommon, as in my case, for, for people to, to identify different elements of themselves on both sides. So when we get into no boundaries, then that is when we're talking about being overly cautious and can push people away and miss opportunities. Um, and so, uh, again, that inherent, you know, hey, I'd like to do something new, or can we try this? A, a gut reaction is no, here's why we can't do that, because that's, you know, I've got a boundary, we don't do that. I, I do these things, this is new, so that's no. Um, so, so keep in mind that that, that that can be just as much of an issue as saying yes to everything and getting yourself overwhelmed. And again, not psychoanalyzing, but just, you know, acknowledging that it can come from a number of places, but some of the places it can come from is it coming from a fear of getting close, trying new things, uh, or, you know, uh, negative previous experiences. Hey, you know, when every time I've tried something new in the past, it's gone wrong. I don't like the unknown. I like certainty. And, and this, this pushes me beyond my certainty and that's uncomfortable. 
or just an extreme uh, sense of duty like, um, you know, I do these things and you're asking me to do this and this is my duty. And so um, just, you know, sticking with saying, missing out on opportunities um, again, because of uh, having the no boundaries issue. So let's talk about when we get in that too loose boundaries, when we talk about the, the yes people, um, what are some of the issues that can come up with that in terms of if their boundaries, if their boundaries are too loose, if you're saying yes too much, um, and uh, how can that impact us ethically? So let's look from our code of ethics. We've got that um, one of our one of our code of ethics is that certified peer recovery specialists will conduct themselves in a manner that fosters their own recovery. This is the one that I feel like I see the most often um, from from the yes folks, and again, including myself, particularly professionally, um, that it's not fostering your own recovery uh, to to work yourself to exhaustion, to say yes to everything, to uh, not have enough time for self care, to um, take on more than you can handle because you feel like you've got to say yes to everything. Um, it, it's it's just it's important. It's an ethical violation to not conduct yourself in a manner that fosters your own recovery. And a lot of the things that we do when we when we push ourselves over that edge, um, we're not fostering our own recovery. So keeping that in mind that it's not just, man, I'm tired and I really should sleep more, but no, I'm, my boundaries are out of whack and it's going to lead me to having some ethical issues if I don't address this. Like we have to understand the seriousness. I think we preach self-care a lot in this field and yet um, most of us are telling other people how much they need to do self-care, but are forgetting or, or feeling like somehow that that doesn't apply to us. You know, oh, I'm too busy for that. So um, just keep in mind um, that that's one of the places that saying yes too much can have can lead to ethical violations. Uh, next, we look at um, from the Code of Ethics, certified peer recovery specialists will promote self-direction and decision making for those they serve. Um, if you're saying by extension, when you say too much, uh, when you say yes too much, uh, a lot of times you also say, let me just do that for you. Um, you and we mean to be helpful. Again, almost all of this is, comes from a place of like, I really want to do good. I want to be a helper. Um, and yet we end up crossing some lines. So we're not going to promote self-direction and decision making for those they serve. Uh, you may have heard the term helicopter parent and there's a lot of discussion about uh, particularly uh, the millennial and zoomer generation having helicopter parents who do everything for them and as a result uh, these kids are saying hey I'm missing out on some important life skills I have a lot of anxiety I don't know how to do what seems like simple tasks like you know i get nervous when the doorbell rings or i can't make a phone call you know those kinds of things it comes from well intentioned the parent who wants no obstacle i mean like isn't that every parent's goal is you don't want your kid to have obstacles you want to like you want to give them the best possible path in life and yet what we see is that you know part of that is that learning how to cope with adversity and so we're not going to be promoting self-direction and decision making for people we serve if we're always saying oh let me just do that for you 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 here uh you need a food bank here let me find you a list of 12 here's 12 different food banks a schedule when you can go and where you can go and here i, I went ahead and, and took the liberty of arranging transportation for you like we want to empower members how to find these resources not do for them and when we get into that mindset of our boundaries being too loose and oh, let me just do that for you, um, then, then we're essentially leading to an ethical violation because we're not promoting that self-direction and decision-making that our members deserve. Next, we look at certified peer recovery specialists will respect the privacy and confidentiality of those they serve. This is a place where we can get into, again, well-meaning, but um, you know, if I call up my friend and say, oh, hey, I've got this member that I'm working with. Her name is Stephanie, and I'm going to send her over your way. She's just, um, I, I know that your church has a, 
a, a food pantry. Will you, if I give her your number, can you help her know how to do the food pantry? Okay, and so I'm assuming my friend there is just a member of a church that has a food pantry, right? So it's not another professional where there's any kind of, you know, they already have an agreement with their agency or anything like that. I'm well-meaning, I'm trying to find them a resource, but that's inappropriate and I, uh, I'm violating their privacy and confidentiality. It's not appropriate for that person to know that my member Stephanie needs food resources unless I've had that conversation with my member Stephanie and said, hey, I know this lady whose church, I don't know how to contact the food pantry directly, but do you mind if I call her and, and put you two in touch? Something like that is appropriate if you're just, again, taking it on yourself, which is a lot of times what that too loose yes mentality is, is let me take it on myself is what it boils down to. But in doing so, we can even um, cross into that ethical violation of privacy and confidentiality. And then also in this category, um, certified peer recovery specialists will not enter into dual relationships or commitments that conflict with the interests of those they serve. This is one of those, uh, one of the biggest challenges because um, this this essentially gets into where we have members who who start to think of us as friends and who are um, if a if a member is inviting you to come to see them play in their softball tournament, then you that's a great time to pause and say where are my boundaries that they even thought it was okay to ask this question? Like I maybe haven't made my boundaries clear enough if they felt comfortable asking the question. Now, sometimes members, you know, themselves don't have appropriate boundaries, so they don't understand what appropriate boundaries look like, but it's always good to pause and ask yourself the question, why did I, what have I said that led this member to think that this was okay? Because it's not okay, we're not friends, we're friendly, that's not the same thing as friends. We have a professional relationship and what can I do to reiterate that? So um, any the, again, those yes things can lead into that member thinking you of you as a friend and it's it certainly if you start thinking of them as a friend also um, perhaps even a, a bigger uh, boundary issue because you're, you know, we have to recognize that we have a professional relationship with the members that we serve. I want to take a moment and talk about gifts specifically as its own separate topic um, because this is, um, I taught ethics a couple years ago at the conference and um, this is, this is the only category I got any negative feedback and the negative feedback was essentially um, I don't care what you say, you can't tell me not to give, not to give stuff to my members. Um, when we talk about this in the CPRS training, this is uh, the, the place where our CPRS has struggled the most. And again, it goes back to that we're in the helping field. Um, so the, from the code of ethics, it says certified peer specialists will not accept gifts of significant value from those they serve. Most people have no trouble with that, um, you know, totally get like, hey, my members aren't in a position to give me gifts, I, you know, whatever. Um, I, we, we talk about some of the gray area kind of stuff, like what if they've made me this beautiful piece of art that I know could sell for hundreds of dollars, but they handmade it just for me, you know, what do we do with that? And we talk about how maybe we ask them if it can be displayed in our office so that all the members can enjoy it so it's less a gift for me and more a gift for the community those kinds of things that's all um appropriate we again we tend to have less issue with accepting gifts than we do giving gifts and when we talk about giving gifts i think that this image comes to mind of oh hey i bought you a present and it's wrapped in cute little wrapping paper with a bow on top and it says to stephanie and you know whatever that's not what we're necessarily talking about although obviously that would also fall into this but where we where we struggle more in giving gifts is in um is really in those those things that we are giving people that are meant to help them. So for example, I know you were hungry, so I bought you a box of food. I know you were cold, so I bought you a space heater. Um, the, the, uh, I'm not gonna say we never give members gifts. I am going to say that we don't give anything to one member that we can't give to every member. And so even in my previous role at United Healthcare, where my staff would go 
directly to the member's home. We didn't meet together as a group. They went to the member's home. And so, hey, you could go to this member over here and this member over here, and this member needs a space heater and this one doesn't. So if I get them a heater, this guy's never gonna know and it's fine. Trust me, it never works out. There always ends up being issues on it. Um, and, and we really just don't want to do anything for any one member that we can't or wouldn't do for every member that we work with. And not just this week, but in our careers, kind of in, in our role, not necessarily your career, because your job may change and that may change, you know, what's appropriate or not. But in, in your current role, uh, if, in the course of a year, if you give a space heater to this person in uh, February and then it rolls around to November and another member and it's been uh, yeah it was nine months ago and now I don't have the money and I did back in February th we can't do that so um, how to address that I think the easiest way to address that is is really to work with your agency to address that it shouldn't have to come out of our own pockets I know that we're givers and sometimes it does but if it's going to come out of our own pockets then that needs to be in the form of like a box within your agency that people can donate hey socks food you know whatever things you have to donate they go in the box and whoever needs something out of the box gets something out of the box it's not like hey I bought socks for you it's there are socks in the box if anybody needs them you know um, where this can come into play too is again it's always well-meaning but like um, I've, I've heard from other peers a, a story of a, a bus driver working at a peer center who had a member who said oh man my heat's broken and it's so cold in my apartment and so the bus driver being kind uh, had said hey I've got some spare blankets at home like didn't even go buy blankets had blankets and just the next day here I brought you a blanket you said you were cold and having a hard time sleeping because it's so cold I just I've had some blankets at home here you go well the next thing you know the member is um, complaining to the staff uh, hey I think he's hitting on me so and and driver totally being well-intentioned um, but and 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 member also just you know not feeling safe and they should be able to feel safe and so nobody intended to do anything wrong there and yet because had that bus driver instead shown up and and just had a pile of blankets on the front seat of the bus and said hey there's blankets available for anybody who needs it that could have been a very different situation so i'm not saying we have to stop being givers and helpers i am saying that we have to be we have to look at what our boundaries are on that to make sure that we stay within those ethical guidelines and the boundaries generally just need to be what you will do for one person you have to be willing to do for all people when it comes to particularly when it comes to gifts okay so then all right we talked some about the, the folks with too loose who say yes all the time let's talk about some of the challenges that can go with being too tight and saying no all the time um, so when we look at our code of ethics, we've got the primary responsibility of certified peer recovery specialists is to help peers achieve their own needs, wants, and goals. Well, um, that's, if your response to things is no, um, then, then we can, we can kind of get in our peers way. So for example, if a member comes to me who maybe doesn't, doesn't have a GED, um, and and says I want to be um, a veterinarian and I know that veterinarians have to add a minimum they go to undergrad then they have to go to vet school we're talking a minimum you know minimum seven eight years of school and and probably more than that internships I don't know whatever and this person doesn't yet have their GED so they're like come on dude can we make a more let, let's let's make a more realistic goal no that's that's me saying no and, and finding all the ways to make the boundaries too tight and say, here's where this isn't going to work. And, but in doing so, I'm not helping them achieve their own needs, wants, and goals. I may think, oh, they, but they, you know, I know about this great CNA program that only takes 12 weeks. Let's focus on that. You know, that's, that's then putting what I think is appropriate. And I need to think of what are the members needs, wants, and goals not my own and and in saying no and finding reasons why yeah this isn't going to work um then i can run into that ethical issue of i'm not really focused on the members needs wants and goals i'm focused on what i've decided i think is realistic and and that's inappropriate and can and can harm the members 
Next, we look at um, certified peer recovery specialists will openly share with peers, other CPRSs, and non-peers their recovery stories from mental illness, substance abuse, or co-occurring disorders as appropriate for the situation in order to promote recovery and resiliency. Now, this is tricky because we say all the time, you should only share what you're comfortable sharing with whom you're comfortable sharing, where you're comfortable sharing it. And yet, um, if, you, if you're, no, I don't know you, you know, as I, I mentioned, I have a tendency, I, I, I keep people kind of at an arm's length. And so I'm like, hey, that's really personal to me. I can't share that with you. I don't know you. Well, on the one hand, it's my story to share, and I shouldn't have to share it. On the other, um, it's a core requirement of the job. You know that if you're going to work as a CPRS, that you're going to have to share your story. And if your response is, I'm not comfortable with that, this is, this is mine, to, you know, I don't want to share it with other people, then, you know, frankly, it might not be the right career choice for you because it is a part of the job. Again, we absolutely have to respect, it doesn't mean you got to, and, and you shouldn't be sharing your entire story with everybody you meet and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's little snippets where it's appropriate, but if you find yourself thinking, oh, wow, I, I've had a similar experience and I've got some really helpful things, but I, I don't know this person, I don't feel comfortable sharing it with them, then, you know, then that actually can get into crossing an ethical issue. So, again, another place to be watchful of your boundaries. And then um, finally, here we have certified peer recovery specialists will promote and support services that foster full integration of in individuals into the communities of their choice. Again, this is another place where, um, you know, I know that I've had members where, again, you know, being a person who has a little bit of a no switch in my brain will, you know, will say to me, um, you know, I want to, I want to move out of this uh, group home that I'm in because they have too many rules and I want to have my own apartment. Um, and I'm like screaming a little on the inside. You need these rules and structure. You're, you know, this is going to be critical without those. You're, you know, you're not going to take your medications. You're not going to blah, 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 blah. But as a CPRS, I'm promoting them having full integration into the community of their choice. And if that's the community of their choice, then it's, that's what I need to be helping them move towards. Now, ultimately, stuff like that isn't my decision, but I can be advocating and helping them achieve whatever they need to achieve to reach that. And so, you know, and if I've got a, you know, that no filter on, <clears throat> then I may, they may miss out on that opportunity. And I've essentially, in doing so, have created an ethical issue. So, again, another place where boundaries lead to um, ethical issues. So how do we know when something is a boundary issue? How do I know? Am I having issues with my boundaries? I mean, I think I'm in a good place, but how do I know? Well, I think that the first sign is simply if you're asking yourself the question, if you're unsure what to do, if you've got that little, something makes you say, hmm, if, if you have to pause and say, what do I need to do here? Then uh, when it's, uh, when there's not a boundary issue, when there's not an ethical issue, the question is very, you don't have to ask yourself, you know the answer. Um, if you're having to ask the question, then there's a good chance that there is a boundary slash ethical issue going on and you need to take a little time and, um, and, and evaluate, you know, what should I do? Um, where are my boundaries in this? Am I, am I being too loose with my boundaries? Am I being too tight with my boundaries? But just the fact that you're asking the question, if you, it, it, when, definitely that's my pulse check is when I say, uh, when I'm, when I am asking myself, is this a boundary issue? Yeah, just that I had to ask, it probably is. Uh, is this an ethical issue? Probably. So what do I need to do to reel that in? Um, another way to identify that you've got a boundary issue is if the member's behavior around you changes, and that can that can look a couple different ways. In the example I gave earlier about the member um, and the bus driver, like maybe that member instead of reporting them, just starts used to sit up front, you know, right to be able to have a close seat, talk to the bus driver the whole drive, and now suddenly they've they they sit on the back seat and stay quiet the whole time. What's going on there? Was it where did I 
introduce some boundary issues into this relationship that's making this member's behavior change. Now, sometimes, you know, other things are going on. There's any number of reasons that member could be deciding to sit, you know, they could be having personal issues and just don't feel like talking and sitting in the back of the bus. But if you notice a member's behavior towards you change and change abruptly and, and isn't just a, you know, one-off kind of situation, then it's definitely worth evaluating is something going on there. Um, or, you know, you've given this member your phone number. Okay, I know you're going through a hard time right now. You can text me in the evenings if you if you need to, you can call, whatever. Well, at first they're only calling or texting when they're having a hard time. And next thing you know, they're like, yeah, now they're sending you memes and, and just saying, hey, what's up? And, you know, it's turned into, it's crossing into a friendship boundary. You know, have we, have we got some, some boundary issues going on there? Their, their behavior towards me changed. They used to only contact me when there was a situation. And more and more they're contacting me for every little thing that goes on in life. You might have a boundary issue to look at. Um, one of the biggest issues we see um, in identifying boundary issue, when you know you've got a boundary issue, is lack of self-care. And I feel like for some reason that we do um, preach self-care all the time, but uh, to everybody else and somehow forget that that really, no, that really means me too. Um, so if you notice your self-care is lacking, there's a very good chance that your boundaries are starting to be an issue. And again, with boundary issues come ethical issues. So recognizing that, um, you know, whatever self-care looks like for you, maybe you're not getting enough sleep. Maybe you haven't had enough, um, uh, I'm a strong introvert. And so I need that, I need some alone time to recharge. If I haven't had enough alone time, you know, that's what self-care looks like to me or time with my dog or, uh, you know, I haven't spent enough time with my husband. Or if you're a person who normally has perfectly manicured nails and your nails are chipped all the heck, you know, I mean, even some, you know, whatever it may be, whatever self-care looks like for you, as soon as your self-care is starting to drop and in a way that you notice it, then there's likely some boundary issues going on. And that may mean that you have to put tighter boundaries on your time is one of the biggest places um, that I think we let our boundaries start slipping. Um, but again, that gets back into that part of the code of ethics where, you know, we have to stay in our own recovery and lack of self-care uh, is one of the, one of the ways that our own recovery becomes jeopardized. Um, and then uh, finally is feeling overwhelmed or drained. And that really ties in a lot to lack of self-care, right? So if you're, if you're feeling overwhelmed or drained, it's probably because you're not getting enough sleep, you're working too many hours, you're being emotionally called upon more than you're emotionally available for. Uh, any of those kinds of things can, can cause you to feel overwhelmed or drained and, and can be a spot for you to step back and say, wait a minute, why am I feeling this way? Where are my boundaries off that, that I am feeling this overwhelmed, this drained? So what do you do when you have identified that there's a boundary issue going on? Um, for those of us who, uh, you know, were at an age where we clearly remember 9-11, um, we saw the signs, if you see something, say something, uh, particularly in airports. And, and, and really, that's it. We're, we, we're a team. As CPRSs, we're all in this together. And so certainly when it comes to your own boundary issues, if you see something, say something, talk to somebody in your life. Um, and that can be, you know, I know that I, I'll turn to my best friend or to my husband or to my mom or, you know, people that I care about and, and talk about, hey, you know, I'm just feeling really tired and stressed and overworked and overwhelmed. I had this conversation recently with several people in my life who I care about and, and talk to them about how do you think I can address this, you know, that's going to feel okay to me. Um, but also be on the lookout for each other, too. Um, I have seen uh, in other peers things that I absolutely knew were coming from a good place, a place of good intention. Nobody meant anything bad. But I said, you know, hey, this thing makes me feel like it's in a little bit of a gray area. I'm a little uncomfortable with that. I just feel like you should know, you know more of the situation than I do, but I'm letting you know from an outsider's perspective, this is what this looks like. Do what you want to do with that, but um, 
I want to make you aware that I feel like that this could be getting into an ethical issue. I've had that actual conversation, and I think it's important, and, and how it has been received always has been, you know, thank you for pointing that out. That certainly wasn't my intention, but, you know, if it, if it looks even a little that way, I want to, you know, make sure that we don't uh, don't create an ethical situation. So talk to your peers to, you know, keep an eye out. We got to keep an eye out on each other as well. Not in any kind of way that is like we're running around, you know, trying to catch each other in trouble, but really I'm supporting you. I, I know we're all in this together and it's important to us all that we maintain this high ethical standard. And so um, keep an eye out for those kinds of things. When you do see something, and it's it, it, something with yourself, particularly, talk to your supervisor about how to address it. When it comes to work problems, particularly, obviously, um, talk to your supervisor about how to address it. Hey, you know, and, and it's okay to admit you messed up. Hey, I gave this one member my phone number because they were going through a really hard time, and I, you know, I recognize now maybe I shouldn't have done that because now they're they're contacting me all the time. How do you how how can I address this? Um, and just work with your supervisor to find a solution and make sure that that solution um, is a, you know, a viable long-term plan. And then, uh, which will lead to then the last point, talk to your member uh, and or members. Because while the, the issue may be with one specific member, the reality is that when something happens with one member, it usually impacts the larger group of members. So uh, in the example of the person texting you after hours, you may have a private conversation with that person in which you address, hey, you know, I, I gave you my number when, we're going, when you were going through a hard time because I wanted to be supportive, but um, I need you to understand that, you know, when I leave here, I've got a family to spend time with. And um, I care about you, but this is, I care about all my members and I can't be, have that kind of availability for everyone. So I, I want to work with you on finding some other people that you can call and text in the evenings, you know, that kind of conversation one-on-one -on -one with that member. But then, um, you know, because rumor mills and just everything else, there's likely that, you know, somebody in your group knows, oh, well, why did that person get her number and is calling and texting her and that's her new best friend. Um, and even if they haven't, it's still just better preemptively. Talk to the group then, and you don't have to call out what happened with that one member. You can just say, hey, I want to talk to y'all about um, what to do after hours. If you have an emergency, I realize that I can't be available for everybody. And so to make sure that we don't have any issues there, let's all make sure everybody's got a plan for who they can contact in the evening. Something to that effect. Um, but but just make sure that you're being open with them, communicative, talk to your members and have a plan moving forward. So then, you know, and and so from now on, my, you know, my plan is I'm, I'm not giving my number out to members anymore. I'm going to have a list of emergency contact numbers available and help them develop who their own personal contacts are, or whatever that looks like for you. But make sure that you don't just address this one situation, because even though it may feel like one situation, it may not be the exact same situation next time, but if you had challenges with that, you know, slipping into uh, being overly available, you're likely to have that. It may look a little differently next time, but it's likely to be a recurring thing if you're not cognizant and aware and setting up a plan to keep it from um, becoming an issue in the future. So. I appreciate everybody's time. This whole virtual conference is something new to us all, but I think it's great that we are still able to connect as peers. Um, I really do uh, appreciate everybody and um, I look forward to the time when we can maybe hopefully next year actually see each other again in person and fist bump or hug or even just, you know, say hey and be face to face. Uh, but I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. I know that everybody when it comes to ethics is it, nobody's meaning to ever fall um, be, uh, below the standard. Uh, and so that's why it's all the more important that we talk about it because it is the slippery slope kind of things, the little things you're not looking for. And so the more we talk about it, the more diligent we are in watching for those things. So go forth and keep doing the awesome work you're doing. Thanks guys.